All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Sugar. I'm the Director of Instructional Design and Technology at Rollins College. And if you're not familiar with Rollins, we're located in Winter Park, Florida, just north of Orlando. And we have about 3,200 students at our institution. We have a mix of grad and undergrad, as well as our um, Crummer Graduate Business School. So I'm here to talk to you about how we are supporting the adoption and the creation of open educational resources at our institution. So I'm just going to be referring to it as OER um, for the rest of the presentation. So in 2015, the library started offering this grant for faculty members. It's modeled af af um, after a similar instructional technology integration grant that we also offer to faculty. So this grant is a three-year grant, and the time frame may vary depending on how frequently the course is offered, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, there is a stipend of up to $3,000 available to the faculty members, and it's broken into segments. So the first year iteration, they get under $1,000 stipend, and then uh, the same for the second and third iteration of the project as well. Um, I'd like to mention that this grant is open to all faculty, whether full-time, adjunct, visiting, as long as they have a continuing contract. So it's open to everyone. And the most important, the key part of this, and um, that's um, led to the success of this program is the official formal grant team that is formed. So when a faculty is awarded a grant, they are assigned a librarian, an instructional technologist, and also work with the director of our teaching and learning center to help them uh, from start to finish. And uh, there's only one grant awarded each year. And so on the Rollins website, there are a lot of great details, and the application is there as well. Um, one other thing that has been very successful with this um, is that the application requires the faculty to do an initial search for OERs, because sometimes you think there's some great things out there, but then there's, you know, it can be very challenging to find those. So we offer consultations. We actually did a come have a cup of coffee and talk about this with us. Uh, so the librarians and uh, my team, uh, we help faculty you know, find those initial things to see if it's even feasible to do that. And then we also ask faculty on the application to uh, start thinking about and identify ways that they can assess the um, impact of using OERs in their courses. So obviously we, our main goal is to reduce the cost of text um, for students. Uh, the second goal, maintain and improve student learning um, outcomes and satisfaction with the required materials. So something that we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're not just adding on OERs to the class, that they're being used in a purposeful way to engage the students, thinking about how they're going to interact with them, how will this impact learning. Um, so that's really important. And then the third goal is to help grow the, the existing body of OER, and if possible, ask the faculty to um, you know, publish, they can share it in a public repository, or at least share it within our college. So I mentioned that the grant is a three-year grant, and I'll kind of give you an idea of the time frame and how the process works. So in the first year, the first iteration of the course, the faculty member teaches the course as is, with traditional text, there's no changes to the content, um, just business as usual. Uh, but this is a very busy year for the grant team. So the librarian, instructional technologist, the faculty member get together and basically all of the rest of those squares up there, uh, we're doing all of that work collaboratively. So if the faculty member will be using existing OERs, then it's locating them, where are they, do we need to compile them, how will they be distributed to students, thinking through all of those things. If the faculty member will be creating resources from scratch, what do they want that to look like? Do they want media embedded? Will there be interaction? Are they tracking anything as part of that OER, or is that going to be done separately in the learning management system? So there's a lot of time in that planning phase. Um, I kind of went into the implementation plan as well. So again, how would this impact the course? Thinking about how it would be used inside the class, how would the students be using it outside of the class as well? And then the team works together to develop the assessment strategies. Uh, we ask that the faculty conduct an assessment with this class, even though they're with the traditional text, and then conduct assessment with two iterations of the course <coughs> that we are. So then moving on to the second year, or the second uh, time the course is offered, this is when the faculty member implements the open educational resources. 
So again, there would be an assessment, and the grant team comes together to evaluate it at the end of the semester and, and throughout. How's it going? How is this working? Um, what changes do we need to make for the next iteration of this? Um, and then identify those revisions and make them before the course is offered the next time. And then the third year, or um, third iteration of the course, the faculty member would teach again uh, with those OERs. So again, uh, it, maybe the OERs were revised themselves, but maybe the way that they were used um, in class, or maybe the ways the students were interacting with them, that part was revised. So we want to make sure that we're trying to improve the um, process for the students. And again, we have assessments. And the final couple of pieces, we asked that the faculty member would publish it to an open repository and then share the results on campus at one of our lunch and learn events or another faculty development workshop um, opportunity. So since uh, this grant was initially offered in 2015, there have been four OER grants awarded. Um, it's been really interesting to see the creativity and they're all very different. Uh, so the first two grants, the first was an art history um, professor and the second political science, both of those were projects where the faculty members were using existing OER resources. The most recent um, grants that were awarded, uh, physics and music, these are both projects where the faculty members are creating brand new um, OER resources. The physics one um, is just a quick story about that one. Um, the, our physics department has these IO lab wireless lab systems. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with them. Very small, powerful device the students can use in the labs, but there's no manual for them. It was a kickstart campaign and the, you know, um, the developers created these, but no one really has the time to figure out how to use them in the labs. So her idea was to create a manual. So she reached out to the de developers and asked if she could do this and it would be Creative Commons open and they were thrilled. So she's working on developing this now and will implement this in the fall with her students in the lab. So the other physics um, professors are very excited as well, and I think it's great that then this could then be shared um, for anyone who's using this device. And then the music um, project is, is interesting. This grant was just awarded. Um, this um, professor, she actually develops a lot of her own materials for this Latin American Expressive Arts course, and she's going to create a, several modules of content that faculty from other disciplines could take pieces and parts and utilize that in their courses as well. So this would be an interdisciplinary project. So one um, project I wanted to share a little bit more detail with you on is a project that I've been working on with a political science professor. So Dr. Julia Maskifker is the instructor, and we've been collaborating with um, Susan Montgomery, the librarian. So uh, she was awarded the grant in fall 2016, and so we've been working on these different iterations with her uh, for this course. So she teaches a course that's titled Problems in Political Thought, and in this course, the students, this, as far as OERs go, and how many of you have searched for OERs or implemented OERs? Okay, excellent, so you have some experience with that. But you know it's very time consuming, can be very challenging, right, to find something that's a good fit. As far as searching and locating, this project was pretty straightforward because the students are required to read uh, texts that are in the public domain. So they're reading, um, Plato, they're reading um, Locke, they're reading uh, several others, so it was pretty easy to find those. But Susan and Julia spent a lot of time working together to find the correct translation, the right versions, and they found um, the, um, the sources in Project Gutenberg. So if you're familiar with Project Gutenberg, the great thing about um, what they offer is they offer many different formats. So there's an EPUB version of the text, students can access it um, just online in a web browser, so it gives them a lot of ways that they can interact with that. So we came together as a grant team and we decided, you know what, let's encourage students to use the EPUB. We can really talk about the rich features. They can highlight, search, bookmark, um, take notes in the digital text if they want to, but we'll let them know that these other options are there as well. We also talked about how teaching would change because it's important to think about um, if you're using these texts in the classroom, you can't just say go to page 135. If I have my, my font increased or I have it on a different smaller device, we all have different page numbers. So we had a lot of conversations about this as well, thinking about how could you use this in a meaningful way in the class. You can have the students search for a section. Um, you can have them highlight passages. You could assign them homework where they have to highlight specific things and then bring that, you know, come to class with their digital text, the chapter highlighted 
for discussion. So it was really interesting to think about the instructional strategies and using this again in a purposeful way. So the for, at the beginning of the semester, Susan and I went into Julia's class and we gave the students an introduction. They picked it up very quickly, no problem, but we just wanted to make sure everyone knew where to go and what to do. So we had them download all six EPUBs. We had them, you know, with the Mac users, it was pretty straightforward. It opened automatically in iBooks. We helped the Windows um, users import it into Adobe Digital Editions. And we showed them how they can highlight and take notes on all of that. And again, I just want to mention the choice. Um, just uh, we made, made sure that the students knew that you know if they wanted to take notes in the text, they could. But if they preferred to take handwritten notes or digital notes outside of the text, great. Do whatever is comfortable for you. So we're in the process of um, we're actually meeting in a couple of weeks to analyze all of the iterations of this um, project that we've been working on. Um, Many, uh, in several of these grant projects, the faculty members are going to be looking at specific assessments that are taking place in each of these courses, and just to see if performance changed on any of those. Uh, but one thing, we worked as a team to develop surveys, and so we surveyed the three iterations of these courses as well. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of um, things that we have discovered in the, in the surveys. So as I mentioned, fall 2016 was the first offering of the course that was pre-OER, so no um, digital text. There were 14 students in that class. Uh, fall 17 was the first OER implementation, and there were 11 students in that class. And then this past spring was the, um, the third iteration, so the second time the OER was implemented with some changes and improvements, and there were 16 students. So small numbers, but it was still interesting for us to look at um, some of these things. So, of course, you know, our first goal is reducing the, uh, reducing costs of text for students. So we asked, have you ever delayed purchasing a textbook because of cost? And I don't know if you can um, see those lines too well. The gray bars are fall 16, orange is um, fall 17, and blue is spring 18. So you can see that over 50% of students in all three of those classes said yes, they have delayed purchase of a text because of the cost. Interesting question that we asked, if all of your college textbooks were free, how would you spend the extra money? <laughs> and what's interesting, you'll see clothes and entertainment got the least, the fewest responses. And so food, you know, um, health, education, those came up as the top choices for how they'd spend that extra money. We also wanted to ask the students about their perception of open educational resources. Um, and what I think is interesting is that um, the fall 17 was the first OER implementation that we had, and um, it's, you know, it's 28%, but 28% said the quality is about the same, but 28% also said it's slightly worse. Um, whereas the first iteration that didn't use any digital text um, actually had a little bit better perception. And there were a few students that just said not familiar enough with <coughs> Um, we asked them um, how they felt the textbooks encouraged them to think in new ways, increase their enjoyment, increase their interest, um, several other questions as well. But again, something interesting is that the pre-OER, which are the gray bars, um, with the traditional text, uh, there were fewer that agreed that um, the text increased their enjoyment and their interest in the subject, whereas the students using the digital text uh, had a higher, uh, more students agreed for that. And again, you know, we think about the strategies that the professor was using in the class with the students engaging them with the text. She was doing some things before with the physical text, but really planning that interaction more so with the digital text in class. Uh, so we, again, I mentioned we gave the students options. So it was um, interesting to see that you know, some still, students still bought the print text and that was fine. They had that choice to do that. And then um, the over 80% of students in both the fall 17 and spring 18 courses utilized the digital text. There were a couple of students in each course that, that did not, and that was fine. And uh, of course we had to ask, did you print? Because we were just curious, did anyone print these digital texts? Because we, some of us prefer to read that way. And there were a couple in each class that either printed the entire text or printed selections of the text. 
Um, so this one, uh, it's a little tricky the way that I did this because this one had um, always, very frequently, occasionally, that was the Likert scale to give you an idea. Uh, so when reading the digital text for the class, indicate how frequently you did the following. So um, there were more students in this last iteration that always or very frequently highlighted in the digital text or took notes in the digital text. Uh, whereas, you know, we see a lot of students still like to take their notes outside, whether it's digitally or handwritten. So some of the lessons learned as we've uh, worked on these various grant projects, time. You need a lot of time, right? And especially that planning phase, uh, so that's very important. And utilize all available resources. So uh, again, I mentioned one of the keys to success that we found is this team, having the librarian, instructional technologist, teaching and learning center. I got an idea from an earlier presentation. We can probably reach out to a couple of other um, groups on campus as well to help us with the assessment piece of this. Um, so thinking about the desired features and interaction, because this, especially if you're creating something, you want to make sure that you are um, planning, that, planning ahead before you're selecting the platform. Uh, you don't want to start using Scalar and then find out that's really not the right tool for you and you have to switch because again, that's going to take more time. Carefully identifying how and when this OER will be used. Again, it, it may change the way that you're interacting with the text and your students are interacting with the text inside and outside of the classroom. And then access. Um, you know, some OER repositories are more flexible with um, formats and, and others are not. So really finding out if there are some other alternatives that allow multiple formats for students and uh, flexibility in how they read. Of course, making sure that it's technically accessible so that screen readers could access the content. And then thinking about the software and hardware requirements. Do the students need anything additional? Um, what kind of support would they need? Get that out of the way first, second week of the class so that way the rest of the time, um, you know, technology is not the barrier. Planning and testing the distribution. So again, thinking about how will the students get this? Um, is it something, are you gonna send them to the website? Or are you going to put something in the learning management system for them? But making sure that that's a very smooth process. If they get frustrated with it from the start, then they're likely not going to want to use it. And then providing student support. Don't assume that students will just magically know how to use these tools, uh, but make sure that, you know, see if they have questions. We found it, again, very helpful to actually go to the class. We took about 10 minutes um, of class time just to make sure the students were set up, let them know what we were doing and why we were doing, and they seemed pretty excited about it. Actually, a few said, oh, can I do this for some of my other classes? And so the librarian was like, come and talk to me, and we'll see if that's possible. <laughs> so, yeah, so that wraps up my question.